Well, this morning, um, I want to turn your attention to the book of Psalms. You're going to be in chapter 40, going from verses 1 to verses 10. You can find this in the Bibles under your seat, most of them, on page 811. Will you stand if you're able for the reading of God's Word? Hear these words, people of God. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the muck and mirror. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to be do not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be, they would be too many to declare. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I say, here I am. I have come It is written about me in the stroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your saving help. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. Here is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Now, does this image remind you of anything? (laughs) Some of you, it might remind you of travel. (laughs) For others, it might remind you of fear. For me, all I see is waiting. If you've ever traveled, you realize that TSA can be a waiting mess. TSA, although it's there for our safety, can be quite annoying. Not only do I have to wait in a long line just to get to another waiting area, then to get on a plane and wait hours longer, but every time I walk up to these folks, they have to touch my hair. <laughs> you trying to tell me that we can land crafts on Mars, we can provide internet to cruise ships in the middle of the ocean, we can have a car drive up, drive up, pick us up, and take us to our destination, all while having no driver. But we can't get machines to look past locks? <laughs> all jokes aside, this the airport for me screams waiting and this waiting is not fun and anticipating and full of just anxious joy it is one that is what I like to call ugh and this ugh is an understatement to the ugh we find in our passage this morning today's passage sits in an interesting spot It is said that the text was written by or in favor of, so maybe someone scribed it, by David during his time of trouble and distress. A time when he was waiting to defeat his enemies. David, a king I might add, is known for his faith and trust in the Lord. So this morning's text, gives us a glimpse into the heart of David. 
when he experiences hard times. What I find very intriguing in our text is how David expresses in his words, his emotions and thought process in this season. See, the theme around this text is something that we all can relate to. We all go through, we all go through hard times, and in the midst of that, we find ourselves waiting, waiting for it to be done. For us to overcome, for good times to be experienced. And David is no different than us. He wanted to be done with this fight with his enemies and found it very difficult to be in a season of turmoil. When David is talking about, or when David is talked about, or even preached about, it often is about his strength how strong he was, how much of a great leader he was, a man after God's own heart. Or maybe it comes out on the other side, with his failures and the huge sin he committed against God, Bathsheba, Uriah, and his community. That's what is talked about. Yet, it is very rarely we talked about how vulnerable this man was, how in touch with his feelings he was, how he shared that he cried, he begged, he worried, and he was afraid. And as a man in his culture, not only just a man, but a leader, not only just a leader, but a king, he also admitted his faults publicly and turned to God in repentance. He confessed to his people that he cries. At the same time, he rejoices with praise. Church, this is the opposite of what we find in our culture when it comes to masculinity. Be strong. Be bold. Be courageous. Don't show weak emotions. You are men. This is literally a quote from a pastor at a men's retreat. Now, to be fair, man or woman, we tend to do this exact same thing when it comes to the season of hardship and waiting. Let us look at David's words in our morning's text to glean from this. It says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and myrrh. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in Him. In these first three verses, David paints a vivid picture of his desperate situation. He uses the metaphor of being in a slimy pit, surrounded by mud and myrrh. And he uses this to describe the depth and the intensity of his troubles and challenges. This imagery of a pit shows the feelings of helplessness, entrapment, and overwhelming despair, suggesting that David's circumstance is not just difficult, but seemingly unbeatable. The mud and the myrrh we find in our text this morning represents the sticky and entangling nature of the problems David is experiencing, making it clear that he is unable to free himself through his own efforts. Now, church, I don't know if you've ever been in a spot like this, where things seem so bad and there is no way out. Or maybe you're like me, or maybe you're not like me, but this has been a reality in my own life. I was entangled in sin that weighed me down so much that it broke me. I felt stuck, stuck in my own way, my own demise, feeling helpless and unable to get out. Yet I smiled and acted like everything is okay, trying to do everything on my own strength. But don't learn from me. Look at our morning text. In this dire and desperate situation, David does not rely on his own strength, wisdom, or his resources as a king. 
Instead, he patiently waits upon the Lord, the text says. And it shows his trust, his faith in the power of God and God's timing. And friends, this waiting is not passive, but filled with hope and expectation. A way different experience of what I feel when I'm at TSA. It is rooted in this belief that God will act on his behalf. David's patient, David's patient waiting highlights the virtue of trust and the reliance on the divine intervention, even when immediate solutions are not visible. And then, with perfect timing, God hears his cry. This divine response is just timely and perfectly aligns with David's deepest needs. God lifts David out of the pit, setting him on solid ground. This act of rescue is profound and transformative to David's life. We'll see that later on in our text. The solid ground symbolizes stability. It symbolizes security and a firm foundation, going against that instability and danger of that slimy pit that he talked about earlier. This deliverance is not merely a physical rescue, but also a spiritual and an emotional restoration. This, power, the pow, this powerful imagery portrays God's ability to reach into our lowest moments and bring us out of the depths of despair. It, ref, it reflects the themes of redemption, hope, and renewal. God's intervention strengthens David, providing him the new sense of stability and purpose. These verses reassure us of how attentive and timely the help of God is, encouraging us to continue to be faithful and trust even in the most challenging times. It serves as a reminder that no, how to, no matter how deep the pit may be, that God's power can rescue and restore. It is always greater. Then we find in verse 6, where David spells out what God is looking for in our season of waiting. He shares that sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my eyes you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, here I am. I have come, is written about me in the stroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. In this hard season of waiting, David speaks of his desire to do God's will. Unlike the Old Testament, where animal sacrifices were the primary means of payment for our sins, David's focus shifts to ritual practices or from ritual practices, I might say, to a heartfelt obedience to God. Let me say that again. David focus shifts from ritual practices, you know, coming to church on Sunday mornings, praying before you go to bed, coming to the Lord's table all holy and righteous. But it switches to a heart of obedience to God. This shift foreshadows the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Through Jesus' sacrifice, we have achieved complete forgiveness of our sins, signifying a new covenant between God and humanity. David's words highlight a deeper spiritual truth that transcends mere ritual. The importance of surrendering our own will to God and prioritizing His will above our own. This surrender signifies a profound trust and dedication in God's plan and purpose for our lives. It encourages us to cultivate a relationship with God that is not based on obligar- like this obligatory rituals, but on genuine faith and obedience. We live in an era, in an era characterized by consistent movement where the expectation is that everything should happen swiftly. 
For instance, instant messaging to same day deliveries. In this modern world, it has conditioned us to desire and even demand the quick results. This fast paced life leaves little room for patience and often creates frustration when things do not happen quickly or as we would like. Now, I feel a little bit guilty because I do like the same day delivery. <laughs> but right in this, I realize that it has conditioned us for sure. Do you remember this Sunday school memory verse that our teachers always made us say? You know, this one. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And if you grew up as a church kid, you have this memorized. You could probably say it backwards. There is a fruit in there that we often say, but sometimes forget. It is the fruit of forbearance. Now the Greek word used for forbearance is better translated to long suffering or patience, and it's probably how you remember it. But this fruit of patience stands out as a particular significant fruit in our fast-paced and demanding world. Patience as a fruit of the Spirit is not merely about waiting for a certain time to be done, although that is indeed an important part of patience. It is also about how we conduct ourselves during the waiting period. Church, we cannot just talk about patience like it's a mere ritual, but we must practice patience by denying self and surrendering to God. And it's important to recognize that God does not operate on our human timeline. His ways and timing are not governed by our schedules or desires. Instead, He works according to His perfect plan and His perfect time. This divine timing is often beyond our understanding, but is always purposeful and meticulously aligned with his greater plan for us. It encourages us to seek a similar attitude of obedience and submission. This willingness to surrender our personal ambitions and desires Our timelines and consistent movements in favor to God's plan is a key aspect of living a faithful and fulfilling Christian life. In essence, David's expression of his his desire to do God's will is not just a personal testament of faith, but a glimpse into the heart of the Christian message. A call to embrace God's will through the example set by Jesus Christ himself. It reminds us that true devotion to God goes beyond the ritual of thinking about or talking about patience. Rather, it is rooted in a deep personal commitment to surrender and submit to God. Finding peace in the stillness and strength in Him that gives it. Friends, this is easier said than done. Even if you're not same day delivery people like me, or ones who demand and seek instant gratification, also like me going on roller coasters, I wait in long lines, and the, the ride is like five seconds. I hate that. We still find ourselves rushing through hard times. It's our human nature. No one wants to suffer, no one wants to endure hard times. At least I know I don't. (laughs) But every time I look back on the hard times in my life, I see how God was at work in my life. I've seen where he's taught me to rely on him, to seek his will, and to trust his plans are good for me. In that season of patience and waiting, the Lord was molding and refining my faith deepening my relationship with him throughout the process. Through every struggle, God's hand was at work in my life, and it is in yours too. Each challenge has been an opportunity for him to teach us invaluable lessons, lessons about reliance on his strength rather than our own, about seeking his will above our desires 
about trusting in his overarching plan for our lives, even when we cannot see the way forward. The season of waiting, which at times feels never-ending, can actually be a season of growth. During these hard seasons, God is not absent, although most of the times he feel like he, it feels like he is. He's actively involved in molding and refining our character. He is deepening our faith and drawing us closer to him, teaching us to lean into his promises and find comfort in his presence. For me, looking back, I could see how this was essential to the hard times that I experienced. They were not merely obstacles I needed to overcome where that I, that I just need to get past and become stronger. They were essential to my spiritual development. There were times when my spiritual, over-supernatural, superficial understanding of faith was transformed into profound, unwavering trust in God's goodness and plan for my life. Through the process, I've come to understand that while the journey might be difficult, the end result, that deeper relationship with God and a stronger, more resilient faith is more than worth the rushing through the hard time of waiting. Church, I want to give you an insight into my own life. Back when I was in college, I wrote a whole spreadsheet about my entire life. The whole thing, including my death date. If I'm being honest, when I look at that particular spreadsheet today, on this day, July 7th, 2024, there is one thing on that sheet that is correct, that happened. Now remember, this sheet was written when I was in college. The only thing that happened that I planned out was that I graduated from college. (laughs) That's it. My plans were so important to me that I had the names of my children, the books I would write, and all these different things. Yet, I did not care what God had in store for me. Yet, when I compared that sheet to the life that I've lived by God, I see where God was way more transformative than the things that He was doing in my life. So while it's natural for us to rush through hard times and waiting, let us remember that these periods are often when God does His most profound work in us. Let us embrace the journey, trusting that He is with us every step of the way, using every challenge to draw us closer to Him and shape us into the people he has called us to be. Coming out of hard, coming out of this hard times and looking back into the season of how we dealt with these things, it leads us believers to do an action. An action of pouring out that which has been poured in. Similar to our one plus one practice we have here at Kelsey Creek Church. Demonstrating patience is a powerful testimony of our faith. In a world that values instant gratification, showing patience can be a culture, a countercultural act that points others to peace and assurance found in a relationship with Jesus. And see this with, and we see this with David. He expresses to the Lord his proclamation by saying, "I proclaim your saving acts in this great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know." I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your saving help. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from this great assembly. So here we find in verse 9, David proclaiming that he will not seal his lips and and keep silent about God's saving act, showing that he's not afraid or he's not hesitant to declare what God has done for him. David's commitment to openly sharing God's deeds highlight this deep sense of gratitude and recognition of God's power and his mercy in his life. By refusing to keep silent, he's ensuring that God's wonderful works are made known to a broader audience 
fostering a community of faith and trust in God's providence. Now, here's a, that's a good CRC word, so you guys should give me a pat on the back. God's providence. His testimony serves as a power, powerful tool for evangelism, inspiring others to seek the trust and God, in God's intervention for their own lives. Moreover, David's willingness to speak out serves as a model for us believers today. It encourages us to reflect on our own experiences of God's faithfulness and to share those stories with others. This practice not only strengthens our individual faith, but also enriches the faith of the community around us. Each of our testimonies add to the collective understanding and appreciation of God's work. By following David's example, we can contribute to the culture of gratitude and praise, ensuring that God's saving acts are celebrated and remembered. In essence, David's proclamation in verse 9 is a powerful reminder of this importance of vocalizing our faith and and experiences. It underscores the impact that personal testimony can have on building and sustaining a vibrant faith community where God's greatness is continually acknowledged and celebrated. Friends, what I find here is the benefit of doing life together. Our shared journey as Christians is not meant to be walked in isolation. We are called to be part of a larger community of believers supporting and encouraging one another as we grow in faith. Not only that, our stories are meant to go beyond these walls into our community by openly declaring what God has done for us. We not only give glory to God, but we also reveal His character to the world. Hearing how God has worked in someone else's life can be incredibly encouraging. It can give hope in the midst of this broken world and lead us to to share with people trusting in God's faithfulness. Let me share a story with you where I had the front row seat to see this in action. Grace and I this past winter hosted a young adult meetup with some friends. We played games, we worshipped, we, we talked about life and how we grew up and just all type of different things. As the evening wind down, we pitched a fire. We all sat around the fireplace with blankets, reminiscing about the past year and our lives growing up and what kind of kids we were, you know, all that stuff. One of our male friends, let's call him Henry, expressed that he will never, and I mean never, get married. In fact, he has no desire to do so. At least that's what he told us. He shared the horrible stories of his father abusing his mother and how impossible it was for him to see himself being in a marriage. To him, it was, and I quote, a hellhole. That was a quote. Everything got quiet around the campfire. I mean, no word was said. We were all just taking in what we just heard. It was extremely heavy. After about seven minutes passed with absolutely not one word being said, one of the other guys, let's call him Dave, popped up and said, you know what? That story sounds like my life. Now we were all shocked. See, David was one of those guys we thought came from an amazing family. He's married, he has a great job, he has a child on the way. He's a great man of God. I might have added an elder in his church. He shared that his dad also abused his mom and his teenage years, and I quote, was a living hell. They both bonded over their similar trauma while we all sat there and listened. But where the story really takes its turn is when David said through therapy, his church family, and the work of the Lord in his life, he was able to not be like his dad, to which Henry said, Man, maybe I could get married. 
I always desired to. Now, it wasn't until about a week later, the Lord revealed to me what I just experienced. Me, Grace, and all those young adults sitting around that fire saw the work, the, the Lord's work in David's life give hope to Henry. Henry felt like he was stuck in a slimy pit, stuck in this mud and mirror. Yet he saw a glimpse of hope that God can do the unthinkable. He can make what you thought could never be a reality, be a reality in your life. And on the flip side, David, Dave, recall me, <laughs> never thought that he could have shared this because it would have made him seem weak. But in my head, it made him look strong. Not hiding the work of the Lord in your life makes you vulnerable. It opens up your weakness to the world. Yet, Paul, yet the Apostle Paul says that the Lord speaks and says, My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. And so therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness. So that Christ's power may rest on me. We find then in verse 10 of our morning text. David's commitment to not hide God's righteousness in his heart. As children of God, we are called to live a righteous life and to demonstrate it through our actions and words. David's unwavering de uh, determination to proclaim God's righteousness highlights the importance of outwardly expressing our faith. He emphasized that he will not be silent about God's faithfulness and, he, and his helping, saving works. This declaration is not only a reflection of David's personal trust and dependency on God, but it's also an invitation for others to witness and embrace that same trust. David's actions serve as a model for believers, illustrating that faith is not just a private matter, but something that should be openly shared. By speaking of God's faithfulness, David reinforced the notion that God is reliable and that he is help and is ever present. This public testimony can inspire and strengthen the faith of others, encouraging them to rely on God's faithfulness in their own lives. Furthermore, we found David ending this section of our passage by declaring that he will not conceal God's love and truth from the great assembly. This powerful statement underscores the importance of sharing the work of God. As believers, we are entrusted with the responsibility to share the truth and love of God. And it's work in our own lives. God's love and truth is universal and transformative for all. Intend to reach all corners of this world. So whether addressing fellow believers or reaching out to non-believers, our mission is to ensure that the message of God's truth and love is accessible to everyone. David's example serves as a reminder that our faith is meant to be lived out loud, influencing, influencing and uplifting those around us. Friends, we find that as we think of waiting, something that is really hard for me. I mean, right in this sermon, I just, the Lord was just speaking to my heart over and over again. We say phrases like, patience is a virtue. That good things come to those who wait. Sometimes I feel like I've been waiting a little too long. And good things are not happening. In fact, I come to the end of a season of hard times. And I look back and I see all that God has done in my life. I can't do nothing but cry. 
There's an old bishop in the Kojic church, which is a, a, a black Pentecostal church. He's the head bishop. And he sang this song, said, When I think of the goodness of Jesus and what he's done for me, my soul cries out, Hallelujah. Thank God for saving me. Friends, you might be in hard seasons now. You might have questions of why. Why in the world am I suffering through this hard time? Or you've been in a season of hard times and you're out of that. Maybe it's time to look back. What was God teaching you? How did God mold you? How did he strengthen your faith? 